Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then I cook or sample the food from the case. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. On April 26, 2005, a call comes into the Duluth, Georgia Police Department. The man making the call is John Mason, and he is calling to say that his fiance, Jennifer, left to go on a jog hours earlier and she never came home. Within hours, over 250 volunteers were searching for Jennifer. They organized quickly, making posters and phone calls and assigning areas to be searched with a fine-tooth comb. The mayor of Duluth rallied the troops and no expense was spared to find this citizen, one of their very own. They were determined to bring Jennifer home safely and everyone in the area and far beyond was very concerned. As the search went forward, all kinds of potential evidence was gathered. A clump of dark brown hair was found next to a retention pond. There were pieces of torn clothing located. People called the emergency line set up for Jennifer's disappearance, saying they found knives and even a gun. Volunteers put up thousands of missing posters and Jennifer and John's families converged to comfort each other and support each other. They would come out of their home from time to time and talk to the media, to the would-be abductor begging for the return of their loved one. The entire country watched as they went through pure agony, the nightmare that none of us ever want to live through, a missing person we love. Every time someone called in with a piece of potential found evidence, the Duluth police were dispatched to the scene. The items were collected and taken into custody with authorities knowing all the while they could turn out to be completely unassociated with the crime, but they weren't taking any chances. Two days after Jennifer disappeared, on April 28th, Major Donald L. Woodruff of the Duluth Police Department announced that the disappearance was being handled as a criminal investigation because there was no other explanation for Jennifer's disappearance. Everyone feared the worst. Someone had done something terrible to one of their own, and all they could do was search and pray and wait for answers. I remember when this happened really well. I was working as a paralegal in the day, and in the evening I was doing culinary training. I kind of got roped into becoming a paralegal because my brother-in-law at the time was a really big attorney, and he had opened an office in St. George. I had some legal experience, so that really wasn't what I wanted to be doing, but it was what I was doing. That's a whole story on its own, and I'm hopeful that one of these days I can tell it here. But I remember I was standing in a commercial kitchen in Salt Lake chopping and working on my knife skills when this story was playing on TV. Everybody was talking about this. It's really funny how the media picks up on certain stories, isn't it? People go missing every single day, multiple times a day, but yet they focus on very specific stories. And this was one of those stories that they focused on. On April 29, 2005, Jennifer Wilbanks' family goes on television and tells the world that they are offering a $100,000 reward for Jennifer's safe return. They state they have planned vigils for every night of the week, and they ask that the public attend to show their support and to help them pray. Not long after the press conference, the phone rang at John Mason's home. He picked it up, and on the other end was his fiancée, Jennifer, the woman everyone was looking for. She told him that she had been kidnapped and assaulted by a Hispanic man and a Caucasian woman. She then called 911 and told them in a panicked voice that she had been taken by these two people in their 40s and that they were driving a blue van. It was a Hispanic man and a Caucasian woman. And in Duluth, okay, and the male that did this is she's black, white, Hispanic, or Native American. Hispanic. About how old? I was, I think, they're, I mean, I would say in her 40s, maybe. What is his weight? Do you think approximately thin, heavy, medium build? <laughs> it was medium build, yeah. Isn't it interesting that they always choose a person of color in these stories? We have problems in this country. We have problems. The dispatch operator asked Jennifer where she was. She said, I have no idea. I don't even know where I am. The police then traced the call to a payphone at a 7-Eleven in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and local police were sent there to pick Jennifer up. Her family was ecstatic. The media captured this clip of them celebrating, hearing that their loved one had been found alive. It was one of the happiest moments of their lives, but very, very soon, their happiness would turn to shock and confusion. 
After Jennifer was picked up in Albuquerque, she was taken in to be interviewed by FBI agents. An interstate kidnapping is a federal offense, and so federal agents are brought in to handle those situations. As these agents spoke to Jennifer, they began to realize that something wasn't right. Jennifer's story just wasn't adding up. There were inconsistencies and things that she couldn't remember that anyone would be able to remember. She fumbled for information and backtracked when she realized she had made a mistake. A few hours into the interrogation, Jennifer Wilbanks makes a confession. There was no kidnapping. There was no Hispanic man or Caucasian woman. She had made the entire story up. Jennifer broke down and told the FBI agents that she was under immense pressure to make her upcoming wedding perfect. As she registered for china and silverware patterns and gifts began to arrive she said she snapped jennifer told the authorities that she is a perfectionist and that all of the details simply became too much for her she later said in an interview with katie couric that she wanted to get married but that the stress of the wedding had become overwhelming she said she handled it the way she always does she kept it all inside she didn't talk to any of her friends or her family members about how she was feeling on the outside, she acted like everything was fine, and no one had any idea that under the surface, Jennifer was in a full-blown panic. That's really sad. I feel really bad about that. It's hard to know that some people deal with things in that way. I don't have that problem if I'm struggling with something everyone around me knows. <laughs> but I know that's not the way everyone handles things, and yeah, I feel for her on that. Still, this was a pretty extreme way to handle it. Jennifer revealed to the FBI agents that she had planned the entire disappearance. She said 11 days before the wedding, on April 19th, she sneaked away and bought a Greyhound bus ticket. She could use that ticket any day that week. It was good for a week. She held the ticket the entire week, going back and forth as to whether or not to use it. Then, on the day it was about to expire, she decided to run. Just four days before her wedding, Jennifer put on her running shoes, packed the things she needed into a little bag, and pretended to go for a jog. At 8.30 on April 26th, she told her fiancé, John, that she was going for a run. Oh, she was going for a run, all right. Yeah, she was definitely doing that. Jennifer left the house and ran. She stopped a few blocks from her home, took out a pair of scissors she had put in the bag she previously prepared, and chopped off her shoulder-length hair to change her appearance. She had only $140 in cash on her. She used some of the money to take a taxi to the bus station at the Atlanta airport. She boarded the bus and slumped down in her seat as it pulled away. At around 10.30 that night, John Mason became very concerned. Nowhere in his mind had it ever occurred to him that his fiancée was planning to run away from home, from their wedding, from him. He didn't find any of that out until later when the FBI brought Jennifer home and told him what she had confessed to them. Well, it didn't take long for the media to find out that Jennifer had lied about the entire kidnapping. The case turned from a national manhunt involving a missing woman to a national joke as the media dubbed Jennifer the runaway bride. She went into seclusion for several days, but the pressure inside the house was reportedly tremendous. The mayor of Duluth went on TV claiming that the town had spent between $40,000 and $60,000 on the search for Jennifer, and that money had to be paid back. Then authorities began talking about criminal charges against Jennifer. She had lied to the police. She had made false statements regarding a crime. And even though people were joking about these events, they were actually pretty serious. On May 9th, Jennifer Wilbanks entered a treatment facility to, quote, address her physical and mental issues, which she believes played a major role in running from herself. At this point in time, the media reveals they have dug up some information on Jennifer. Jennifer has a criminal record. She was arrested on three separate occasions in the 1990s for shoplifting thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. Each time she was given community service and probation. Just a little side note here. We often see shoplifting as kind of an annoyance, a petty crime, but uh, us true crime lovers know that it can be the start of a very long and prolific criminal career. Shoplifting is often the first indication that someone is headed down a very dangerous road. It's risky behavior. It feeds that adrenaline addiction, and it can often be a very serious red flag. 
On May 17th, Jennifer canceled her engagement to her fiance, John Mason. I mean, I think we all saw that coming. But sometime before that happened, I'm assuming is when she sat down with Katie Couric and John for the now famous interview. The interview aired in mid-June of 2005, so they had to have sat down and done this interview maybe right before she went into treatment, while in treatment. And that's strange because in the interview, she reiterates over and over how she wants to be married. This poor guy, John, is just kind of sitting there like a deer in the headlights, but he's trying to be supportive. He's trying to keep his composure. But anyway, not long after this interview, days, maybe a week, they called off the engagement. Katie Couric just straight up asks Jennifer, do you realize how much you hurt your family? Did you think about that at all? And Jennifer basically says she didn't. She was so overwhelmed at the time that she didn't even think about what it would do to her family. The couple then reveals that when Jennifer came back, John again asked Jennifer to marry him. He was ready to go through with it. And in the interview, they say they hope they can get married soon. Jennifer then reveals in the interview that she had a bus ticket and a bottle of pills, but that she decided not to play God that day and to use the bus ticket instead of the pills. You never see a tear fall from Jennifer's eyes, which there is a lot of talk about her eyes online. She seems oddly detached from everything going on. There's just something very off about her and frankly about John in this interview. It's like it really hasn't sunk in for either of them at that point. On May 25th, 2006, Jennifer Wilbanks was officially charged with making false statements to the police. She hired an attorney who set about negotiating with the city some kind of settlement so that Jennifer would not be arrested. Her attorney was successful on that and they reached an agreement that Jennifer would pay the city of Duluth $13,000 in cost reimbursement for part of what was spent looking for her. But that's not the end of the story. On October 10th, 2006, Jennifer filed a lawsuit against John, claiming that the home they owned together was sold out from under her and that she was owed half of the proceeds. She also claimed that while she was medicated, being in an emotional state, John negotiated a book deal for them and that he didn't get what she wanted for that deal. In return, John countersued Jennifer. The legal wrangling went on for only a few weeks when both parties decided they wanted none of how nasty it was getting and they both dropped their lawsuits in December of 2006. Sometimes I don't think people realize how stressful litigation is. If you've never been involved in litigation, count yourself lucky. It is very, very stressful. Now, almost 17 years after these nationally broadcast events, Jennifer Wilbanks lives in Gainesville, Georgia and works as a human resources director at a telecommunications staffing agency. She found love in 2010 and married Greg Hudson, who owns a landscaping company. Not long after Jennifer's disappearance, a doll company created a Barbie doll styled after Jennifer. When it was produced, it came with a small towel to put over the doll's head, reminiscent of how Jennifer appeared when she was taken into custody in Albuquerque. A hot sauce maker then created a special sauce for the story that was called Jennifer's High Tail and Hot Sauce. And someone even carved Jennifer's likeness into a piece of toast that sold on eBay for $15,000. Lordy, the things people spend their money on, I will never understand it. Years after the incident, the Albuquerque Police Department capitalized on the story, making a billboard that said, Running away from your current job? Call APD Recruiting. <laughs> this is quite the story, and yes, we get a lot of laughs over things like this, but Jennifer's family wasn't laughing when she disappeared. Sometimes it's easy to forget that little white lies can turn into bigger lies, and those big lies can swallow us up completely. Well, Jennifer and John never had their wedding, but had they done so, I can almost guarantee you that the food I'm gonna make for you next would have been served. Let's go dining with death. Normally, this is where I say we are ready to cook, but we're not really cooking today, we're assembling. If the runaway bride had had her wedding in Georgia, I can almost guarantee there would have been pimento cheese sandwiches. 
If you're from the South or you have exposure to the South, you are already well aware of what pimento cheese is. When I lived in Texas, it was everywhere. You could buy it in the grocery store. And I've noticed even here in Utah, in Las Vegas as well, I've seen it a couple of times in the grocery store. So it is more widely known now. It's basically a spread for sandwiches. It makes kind of a cheese sandwich. It's a very flavorful cheese filling. So let's make us some pimento cheese. It starts off with a brick of room temperature cream cheese, two cups of medium or sharp cheddar shredded, a half a cup of mayonnaise, a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder, a quarter teaspoon of onion powder, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And the version I prefer has little tiny diced jalapenos. Now classic pimento cheese does not, but I've noticed as of late, a lot of people are adding a little bit of diced jalapeno. It adds some crunch and some earthiness and it breaks up the richness of the cheese. So I prefer this addition, you can leave it out. And last but not least, we have the pimentos in pimento cheese. Pimentos are a little fruit, vegetable that grows on a tree. Um, most people know them as the little red thing that's in the middle of a green olive, but it is its own ingredient. You're gonna drain a four ounce container of pimentos and add that to your spread. And now we're gonna mix it up. That smells like pimento cheese. It has a very distinctive smell. The pimentos don't have a lot of flavor, but they do have a scent that's unique. You're gonna get you some really American, really white bread. <laughs> Big old dollop of pimento cheese. Bread that around. I feel like this is such a 50s recipe, right? Put your top on and cut the crusts off. Leaves you a beautiful little square and you would most likely see this cut on the diagonal for a tea size sandwich. There it is, a little pimento cheese sandwich, finger sized, that you would very likely see at a southern wedding. Let's give it a taste. It's good. It's very homogenous. It's very American tasting. And it's quite rich. That's why I feel like it needs the jalapeno. It's just a little bit of crunch and a little bit of spice. You know, jalapenos have that rose flavored kind of earthy quality to them. But yeah, it's a lovely little Southern delight. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death. Hit that like button if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more from me. If you'd like to further support me, you can join my Patreon. That helps immensely and you'll also get some bonus content. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.